everyone. Hello and welcome to the Berlin Epidemiological Methods Colloquium. My name is Jess Roman and together with Teuvel Glatz, Tobias Kurt, Hannah Grillmeier and uh, some panelists that we've invited today, we'd like to welcome you to our first BEMP talk of the year 2021. Uh, from near and far, that is one advantage of having the lecture series now online, is that we can welcome people from across the globe. And I'm really excited about our talk today. We've invited an excellent uh, scientist, researcher, and hopefully speaker. That's what we've heard, so we're very excited to have him with us today. No pressure. Um, this is doc Dr. Matthew Sparin from the University of Manchester. He works in the Division of Informatics, Imaging, and Data Sciences. And uh, his background is in a, comes from the mathematics and statistics. It's always interesting to see how people uh, get into this, let's say, epidemiologic statistical method field. Um, he did a PhD in statistical genetics and found his way then into this topic of when causal thinking might be needed for prediction. And I think that it would be fair to say that he is really a pioneer in the use of counterfactual prediction for cardiovascular risk scores in, in particular, which is how um, we got in touch and are very eager to hear and share more about this topic with all of you. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we're doing this every month on the first Wednesday of the month at 4 p.m. We record a lot of our lectures and post them online like we're doing with this one. So please uh, be aware that this lecture is recorded. We'd love to hear from you. Um, if you have questions, Matt will answer the questions at the end of the talk. You can use the button uh, Q&A at the bottom of your screen to ask questions of our speaker. And we will actually happily unmute you for the discussion round so you can actually ask your own questions that part of the talk will not be recorded. So uh, no pressure there. I just wanted to mention also that after this uh, talk, we will go over into the platform Wonder for a more informal social. And I'll tell you more about that at the end of the talk. Okay, enough from my side, um, we'll get started. So thanks a lot, Matt, for joining us. And we're looking forward to your talk. Uh, thank you for that lovely introduce introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to, uh, well, not be here, but uh, but be with you all. And, and we were just saying, I think one of the great things about this online move is that uh, we get uh, an international audience. So, uh, so good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, depending on uh, where you're uh, calling in from. Um, I hope that what I talk about today is going to stir up quite some debate. So I'll talk for maybe 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have plenty of time for some discussion at the end. Uh, first of all, I'm keen to thank collaborators, uh, not least because I've either uh, deliberately or accidentally, no doubt, stolen uh, slides and uh, other material from them. Uh, so uh, to highlight, first of all, Li Jing, who, uh, who is, um, been working with uh, myself and other colleagues for the last couple of years, um, sort of putting together um, what's going on across this field in a scoping review that, that will soon be published. And uh, a number of other colleagues, both at the University of Manchester and uh, further afield. And, um, and I'm sure there's also somebody in the audience who, uh, who I've forgotten off this list that should be there. So uh, apologies to them. Okay, um, I thought it would be useful to begin just to take a little bit of a, a step back, just as um, a reminder on, I suppose, the, the perspective here. So I'm, I'm sure many of you will have uh, seen the paper from uh, 2019, I think, from uh, Miguel Hanan and colleagues, uh, Second Chance to Get Causal Inference Right um, about data science. But uh, but what, what the, the thing that I personally really liked about this is this because as statisticians, I suppose, we like to categorize things, is this trichotomy of, uh, of tasks that we conduct in data science or statistics or machine learning or whatever we want to call it. So description, prediction, and uh, counterfactual prediction or causal inference. So I guess, you know, a starting point, first of all, I mean, I'm sure, you know, as we're reading and reviewing papers in the epidemiological literature and elsewhere, the first thing that's very striking is that 
people typically don't really know which of those they're doing. So I guess before we even get on to when to do causal inference with prediction, um, you, you, you know, this is this is already sort of, uh, you know, go, going to be quite new to, to, uh, to some of the literature where, you, you know, you'll see, you know, a lot of papers in the epidemiological literature in particular, where it's just totally unclear, you know, you'll see these papers that are very unclear what the actual objective of the, the whole exercise is. And if you try and categorize it into one of these three buckets, it's not at all clear. Um, but of course, I mean, you know, I think a lot of the interesting stuff is happening now at, at where we combine uh, some of the ideas from each of these three buckets. So one area where that's been happening a lot is in uh, sort of what, what I'd call, you know, where the, where the goal is a, a pure causal inference question. Um, so, you know, what's the effect of, of X on Y? Um, then uh, there's been quite a trend that methods from prediction have been used a lot uh, more and more in that field. So for example, um, if we're estimating a propensity score, then you know, a lot of sort of techniques developed in prediction, whether that's you know, fancy machine learning algorithms or, or whatever, are used to try and sort of optimize the construction of um, something like a propensity score in, in various ways. Um, perhaps, personally, one thing, one thing I don't quite like about this paper is that I'm not so keen on the term counterfactual prediction, at least in the context it's used here, because it, it kind of suggests that if you view those two counterfactual prediction and causal inference as interchangeable, that, count, that causal inference is sort of like prediction, but prediction plus. And, uh, and, and I don't think that's necessarily true because um, often in causal estimation, we're only interested in a contrast or you know, perhaps in a, in a function that describes a contrast conditional on, um, on other factors if we're interested in subgroups or um, you know, sort of conditional uh, causal effects of various kinds. Um, but, but when it comes to prediction uh, and particularly um, sort of deploying prediction into healthcare to support, um, to support clinicians, to support decisions being made in healthcare, we're often very interested, rightly or wrongly, in absolute risk. And, you know, and the prediction literature has developed um, a lot of tools and techniques to ensure that uh, that focus on absolute risk means that you know we we arrive at models that do well at predicting absolute risk. So, so, so just to make clear that I suppose what I'm interested in in here is how I would define counterfactual prediction, which is perhaps, although I'm sure people will disagree, and we can discuss this later, is you know it is a bit more than causal inference because we are so specifically interested in in absolute risk as well. Um, but um, you know, hopefully the talk sort of makes clear a bit what the, uh, the, the perhaps subtle uh, distinction I'm making there is. All right, so this is just a very general uh, slide. I'm, I'm sure this isn't news to, to a lot of people here, but so a clinical prediction model essentially is, is just some tool used in, in healthcare or in a clinical application where we're interested for whatever reason in predicting some outcome why, and we would like to do that based on some available predictors. So cardiovascular risk that was mentioned in the introduction. Um, we have uh, perhaps a, a healthy individual, whatever we mean by healthy, and uh, we're interested in their risk of having a cardiovascular event over the next 10 years, for example. And something happens in the middle that converts those predictors into an outcome. And uh, I don't focus too much on that in this talk. So that's why I've just drawn, do we just have the crystal ball there? But of course, this could be, you know, anything from a logistic regression, um, Cox regression model, depending on what the outcome is. Uh, or of course, it could be a, a you know, a, a deep learning model or, you know, any other variant along those lines. So I suppose, depending on the, the scenario that we're interested in or, or perhaps the interests of the people that have developed the model. So in this field, typically um, we develop um, a prediction model by taking some training data. So for some people that we know both the predictors and the outcome, and then we validate out of sample in some way. Uh, and, and of course there's different ways to do that, uh, bootstrapping, cross-validation or a sort of pure uh, holdout set. 
um, to assess what the performance of the model is like in, in new individuals. And then hopefully these models get deployed into practice and are used in some way to support some kind of decision. So here's an example. Um, so hopefully this isn't too small, uh, but this is QRISC, which is quite a well-known um, clinical prediction model in the UK. So QRISC um, takes, is a cardiovascular risk score, which takes a series of inputs and calculates the risk of a heart attack or stroke within the next 10 years. Uh, there's equivalent versions of scores that do different things that are used in different settings as well. So there's some um, framing um, um, and, and many others um, that, that all aim to achieve this. So underlying Q risk is a, is a Cox regression model. Um, and the 10 year risk is just produced by pulling out the, the Breslau absolute risk estimator from the, uh, the cumulative hazards and then applying all the hazard ratio adjustments to produce this um, risk of heart attack or stroke within the next 10 years. And in the UK, this is used uh, to guide patient care. And the way it's used is that there is a guideline in, in the UK healthcare that says, um, if this risk exceeds 10%, then the patient should be considered for uh, cholesterol lowering therapy uh, statins, uh, regardless of their underlying cholesterol. So it's, so it's sort of a risk-based decision rather than a risk factor based decision. So you know, I, I guess it's interpreted quite widely by clinicians. So somebody with a risk between 10 and 20% is maybe given some lifestyle advice uh, first. Um, but then, you know, but, but ultimately, the idea is that um, it's, it's to guide some sort of preventative action to try and reduce the, the risk of a heart attack or stroke. So this is, I suppose, being used in a pure prediction way. So, so far, there's no consideration of causal inference. This is just we've taken some past patients. We've looked at these baseline risk factors and demographics and produced uh, the probability of heart attack or stroke in the next 10 years. So let me give some motivations now on why uh, it would be of interest to um, consider um, let's say hypothetical or counterfactual predictions and, or, or in some way consider causality when we're thinking about these predictions. So let's suppose we have uh, this patient, um, Joe, who, who has a cardiovascular risk as from the previous slide uh, of 17%. So what the clinician uh, or the patient um, may then want to discuss, given that this is over the threshold of, of 10%, um, is, well, what can I do about that? And, and that then immediately is a, a what if question. So what if I stopped smoking? What if I lost some weight? What if I reduced my blood pressure? And one way that we can get that information, of course, is by, well, we know, um, well, perhaps so if we say, what if we started statin? So we know that the risk reduction conferred by statin is about 25%. So we, we can answer those questions. But um, we've had numerous discussions with clinicians and, and what they actually do, um, which is a bit worrying actually, um, is, or, or, you know, we certainly have evidence a number of clinicians do this. So they go back to the calculator and say, okay, so what if you stop smoking? Well, at the moment we have this set to heavy smoker. Let's change that to X smoker and then press calculate risk. And now we have a new um, risk of a heart attack or stroke within the next uh, 10 years. And therefore we do 17% minus whatever the model comes out with 10% say. So therefore you have a 7% risk reduction by stopping smoking. Um, and I mean, I'll, I'll say a bit about the problem, but I'm, I'm sure that uh, everybody on this webinar understands why that is not going to work. So. You know, if you haven't read, so it's like a sort of strong version of the table two fallacy is one way to describe it. So the table two fallacy where we're interested in one causal effect, and then we shouldn't interpret any of the other um, effect estimates in table two. Well, here, when we developed a prediction model, we weren't interested in any causal effect. So none of the, um, none of the coefficients of the, um, of the clinical prediction model, and therefore none of these contrasts and probabilities that pop out at the end have the desired um, 
you know, interpretation that correspond to these sort of hypotheticals of different um, potential interventions. And this is exactly the kind of problem that causal inference, of course, is, is set out to, uh, to solve. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so, so this is just sort of spelling out explicitly what the problem is. So, um, I mean, I'm exaggerating for an effect, you know, I'm not trying to claim that, you know, prediction is easy and causal inference is hard, but, you know, in certain aspects, there's a lot more work that needs to be done in, in if we're interested in causal inference. So with prediction, um, you know, with a number of reservations, you could say, well, one way of coming up with a prediction model is I just get all my predictors, I throw them into my black box, whether it's a, you know, an out pops a prediction and that's okay. And of course, with causal inference, we have to think very, very carefully um, about what the relationships between the variables are. And, you know, and if we made an intervention, what sort of, what variables in the, uh, you know, the causal graph or the directed acyclic graph are affected and, you know, what we should adjust for to close all the backdoor paths. Um, you know, I was, I was watching uh, Peter Tennant's talk um, recently and, uh, you know, and the sort of, you know, where the whole discussion was on how difficult a particular causal effect is to estimate. So, you know, we're, we can never expect a prediction model to provide the um, causal effects that we're interested in. I mean, of course, that's not to say it never will. So, you know, that it may be by some coincidence, um, the model happens to adjust for all the uh, variables that are, you know, that, that block all the backdoor paths between the exposure you're interested in on the outcome and happens also not to block, you know, just for any mediators or colliders. But, you know, th this seems pretty unlikely and, uh, and, you know, and we should be quite nervous about uh, relying on that happening. So, so that's motivation one, I suppose. That the, we know that this plug-in approach is used, it happens. Um, and, you know, we, we should do something to help uh, the users of these models be able to carry out these uh, these exercises in a more robust way. Um, the second motivation, and don't worry, I'm, I'm, <laughs> most of this talk is on motivation. You know, I'm, I, I, um, I, I won't talk too much about uh, um, you know the solutions. Uh, you know, are, are in the way things we all know. Um, so the second motivation is is clarity around what it is that. Um, the prediction model is is actually estimating, and and I think this is a really big and, and quite underappreciated problem. Um, so 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 let's talk through this. So we have an individual with baseline variables. So maybe it's cardiovascular risk factors, and we use our model to predict the outcome for that individual, their risk of um, a cardiovascular event in the next ten years. So remember where this model was developed. It was developed using some historical data. And now with, you know, with a tool like QRISC, that's probably based primarily on data over the last 20 to 30 years. So over that time period, um, individuals with, um, um, you know, with high blood pressure or high cholesterol, you know, they weren't just left to their own devices. You know, the, you know, even, you know 20 to 30 years ago, even then, uh, clinicians obviously knew that something needed to be done. And they did something. So certain care and interventions will have been received. So the individual with their baseline variables is being the, the outcome that you collect is the, the outcome that you predict is essentially going to be based on similar patients um, in the past with those risk, risk factors and what their outcomes were. And that, of course, depends not only on the baseline risk factors of those patients, but also on what was done to attempt to mitigate the cardiovascular risk. Um, and the reason why I think this is a big problem is that decisions on what to do are, as we've seen with, with that previous example, are often made on the basis of the calculated risk. And although it's usually not explicitly stated, um, the implicit assumption there is that the probability that pops out from the prediction model tells us what would happen if we didn't do anything. So your, you know, your, your cardiovascular risk is 17%. How can, what are we going to do to, to, to do about that? Um, but of course, doing nothing probably has an even higher risk because similar patients in the past, things will have been done. 
So causal inference again can can come to our aid here, and um, and the best paper to read on this, which um, is in the references at the end, is uh, a recent publication in uh, I think European Journal of Epidemiology by uh, Nam van Gelderen and colleagues, which uh, which really sort of talks through how important it is to have clear um, S demands under which we're making these predictions. So let me just give uh, another example. Um, no, well, we have to have COVID examples, of course, at the moment. Um, and there's a, another a mortality score, um, which is now, I believe, used, uh, at least in the UK. And um, it's a hospital triage COVID score. So the idea is patients arrive at hospital, they immediately have um, some of the by now well-known uh, risk factors measured, like C-reactive protein and um, oxygen saturation on room air. Um, and a prediction is made of their mortality risk. And, um, and in the paper, they say patients with a score falling within the low risk group, for example, a risk of 1%, uh, might be suitable for management in the community, um, et cetera. Um, so, of course, the problem with that is that the low mortality risk is not necessarily that the mortality risk that will be achieved by discharging that patient from the hospital and sending them back into the community. That's based again on past patients, you know, probably now from the beginning of the pandemic when, okay, there weren't many treatments, but we, you know, we were certainly monitoring patients very closely and, uh, you know, had uh, ventilators and other equipment to hand to look after them. So, you know, again, you know, these kind of decisions being based on these models is, is, I think, a bit problematic. And here we probably want to know what the risk actually is, um, you know, assuming that, that we don't do anything. And the third example motivation that I want to mention, um, which I suppose is, is along the same thing theme as um, clarifying the S demand, but just extending that idea a bit. And it's um, the problem of treatment drop-in because it's been talked about a bit in the literature and um, it's sort of identified even without thinking about causal inference, it's identified as an issue. So, um, so suppose again, that we're interested in this do nothing risk. Um, so cardiovascular risk, if we do nothing, what will happen over the next 10 years? And we fit our time to event model. Um, and the question is, how do we handle patients who start taking treatment during follow-up? Um, so, because what these risk scores often do, so they're aware that, you know, there is some awareness that what we really want is a treatment naive risk. So we say, okay, well, um, you know, we're, we're interested in a statin intervention. So let's excuse, exclude everybody who's taking statins at baseline. Um, but of course, then the problem is without thinking along causal lines, it's quite challenging to decide what to do with people who start taking statins during follow-up. Uh, so you can see that any of the sort of naive things that we might try and do um, are going to lead to bias. So, you know, excluding them is going to lead to bias, even censoring in them um, will potentially lead to bias because it's sort of, an, you know, it's obviously an informative uh, dropout process. So, so we do have to be quite careful about how we handle this issue of treatment drop-in because we're interested specifically in this um, uh, treatment naive risk. And, and there, you know, and, and there we're sort of, sorry, I should have said what, what we're then thinking of is, you know, what we probably mean by do nothing is not just that we do nothing today and then you come back tomorrow and I'll give you the statins, but, you know, we do nothing now and we probably carry on doing nothing for the next 10 years and wait to see what's happening, what, what's going to happen. That's probably the, the sort of um, S demand that, that is really of interest to the clinician. Okay, so, I mean, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here to some extent, but, you know, ad addressing those kind of questions effectively, we're making predictions um, under interventions or, you know, we're making hypothetical predictions or counterfactual predictions um, so anyway, I'll just, uh, so some of the things that I'll sort of go on to talk about are drawn from a, a scoping review that, um, as I say, my, my colleague Li Jing um, led on over the last couple of years, where we focused on um, identifying approaches that are being used 
uh, for making interventions using for making predictions under interventions using causal methods. So this idea, as, as I've said, it's the intersection of prediction and causal inference. So not just trying to do effect estimation, but but caring considerably about um, about the absolute risks that have been estimated as part of that process as well. And um, well, we at least um, when we looked at the review, we we sort of categorised. Um, these the the approaches that we found into two groups. So one of which is that we somehow separate in there's some separation between the prediction and the causal part. So we we have a prediction model which is somehow supplied uh, externally estimated causal effects, perhaps from a randomized controlled trial. Um, or the second way is to um, is to do everything in one. So we have our you know, observation or development data set for the um, for building the prediction model, and we also use that to estimate our um, causal effects. So, just to give a couple of brief examples of this um, this first solution, which which I actually think is very, uh, despite uh, despite my paper in statistics and medicine that I'll talk about being in, in category two, I actually think this is probably the most attractive uh, solution to this kind of problem. Um, and the idea essentially is that um, you estimate or, or find that the causal effect that you're interested in from another source, such as a randomized controlled trial, uh, develop a prediction, predictive model from the complete accurate observational data, and then apply these relative treatment effects from the randomized controlled trial to the um, estimated outcome risks from the observational data. Um, so, so, so that's the sort of, you know, the simplest thing you can do. Um, a slight problem with this, I mean, yeah, this is okay, I think this is a great starting point, um, but one problem you do come up against is, is this issue of the lack of clarity around the estimand. So, um, so that 17% risk that we calculated before, um, you know, it's not that we then say, okay, well, smoking reduces the risk. Stopping smoking would reduce the risk by, I don't know what it would be, 15%, and we apply that because it's not quite clear that that 17% is sort of a pure, um, you know, you know, based on a population that not only smoked on the day that the, uh, um, the risk was calculated, but continued to smoke for the next 10 years as well, up until they had their cardiovascular event. So it, it can be a bit unclear, you know, so, so for this idea to work, we do have to be clear on what we mean by baseline risk. So again, you know, there is a, a bit of clarity needed there. Um, but there's, a, you know, a, a couple of really good examples of where people are doing this sort of thing. So one that I'll highlight is, um, is the PREDICT uh, breast cancer score, um, which is led by uh, Paul Farrow in, in Oxford and um, a number of colleagues there. And uh, and what they do there, which again, simple, but, but a very nice solution, is that um, the treatments are essentially all in the prediction model as covariates, but we don't estimate the, the hazard ratios or the coefficients. They're fixed to their uh, values as, as imported from the clinical trial. So, you know, I don't know. I, I think of it a bit, it's probably wrong, but I think of it as being a little bit like an offset term, you know, so, so, so anybody who has, who receives a treatment, you sort of offset that from, from their risk according to the fixed, uh, not estimated here, um, hazard ratio of that treatment. Um, you know, I think there's, of course, there's caveats to doing this, but, uh, you know, I think this is a nice, simple starting point to actually get something that is, is going to do something quite close to the right thing. Um, you could also use a similar idea here for um, treatment drop-in. Um, so I've, so there's um, some work from, um, from Cambridge, which I think is just about to be published in the American Journal of Epidemiology on this, where essentially you estimate a clinical prediction model here for cardiovascular risk, and you keep track of when people start taking statins as a, as a sort of time dependent uh, variable. Um, and then apply the, the, the correct hazard ratio adjustment um, at the times when a person is receiving 
um, statins to, you know, to therefore sort of modify the, the, the risk in that way. And so, so, you know, by doing that, you end up with a treatment naive risk, even for people who, uh, who have dropped into taking statins by making that adjustment. So yeah, again, you know, I, th I think it's an, a night, you know, this caveats, but I think a very nice, simple solution to this kind of problem. Okay, so the, the other kind of thing that, that, that you can do is to try and, you know, but have some degree of, uh, well, optimism, let's say, that we can take our observational cohort and, and we can build both a good prediction model and a good, um, and make good counterfactual predictions at the same time. Um, so if we think about this, first of all, for, I suppose, you know, if you imagine you have a binary outcome and everything, you know, that, that happens shortly after the predictors so that we don't have to worry about treatment drop-in. Um, uh, there, there's various ways that, that this can be done. So one sort of approach is that you build a model in the treated individuals and you build a model in the untreated individuals. And then as long as um, the predictors that you have in those models um, achieve conditional exchangeability between those two groups. So in other words, you account, you know, they account for any confounding and estimating the causal effect between the treatment without introducing any um, uh, colliders or mediators and things like that. Then, you know, we, we can interpret these, um, these kind of models in, in the way that we want. Um, and I'd say with this, you know, given, given that we know it's very, very hard with observational data to estimate, a, you know, a, a single homogeneous effect estimate, um, you know, I think th these methods are quite optimistic in terms of the assumptions that they require. But, uh, you know, I guess if, if, you know, if you're interested in knowing how the effect estimate varies, accord, you know, according to um, the predictors as well, then, then these kind of approaches have some potential, but uh, yeah, rely on really huge, quite strong assumptions. And of course, this idea um, extends in quite a straightforward way to um, treatments over time, treatment drop-in. So here we can do the same kind of thing, but now of course we, we need to rely on uh, G methods like the um, marginal structural models. So. So there I refer to my own work from a couple of years ago, um, where we were, again, we were interested in this question of predicting treatment, naive cardiovascular risk, correcting for treatment drop in. And, um, and the way we did that was by using um, an approach based on marginal structural models to correct for the um, treatment drop in. So um, again, I'll just very quickly show the idea behind this because I guess the, I mean, the only thing to think a bit, a little bit about uh, compared with the marginal structural model is, um, is that we have to be quite careful about what our prediction time is and, and to be clear about what we mean when we're referring to uh, the information that we need to use from the future. So here, if, so in this diagram, um, we're intro the treatment here is, is, you know, is, is setting uh, A0 and A1. So a, a, the A could be statins here. And we're, we're at time zero, so we know L0 and we're, we're about to decide on A0. Um, but of course, we don't know L1 and we don't want to uh, have that in our model. So, so I guess the, 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 so the only extra thinking that has to happen here compared to the marginal structural model is well, you know, I want an accurate absolute prediction. So therefore, you know, if, if, if the DAG is quite simple and looks like this, then I should, you know, have all the, so of course I have to make sure that A0 contains all the, all the things to avoid biasing the cause, sorry, the L0 contains all the things that avoid confounding the causal effect. But as well as that, I should also include things that I think are just good predictors of the outcome, but perhaps have nothing to do with um, A0. So just the prognostic factors as well um, can go in there. Um, and then I can argue that even though I have to make a prediction by specifying A1, of course, that's an intervention that I'm hypothetically proposing at time zero. So it's okay to, to specify what that needs to be, even though it's in the future. And um, 
and in a way you you you, you know so, so L1, so with a standard marginal structural model, the problem you have with, with the L1 is that you don't want to adjust for it because it, um, it mediates the effect of A0, but you do want to adjust for it because it confounds the effect of A1. And of course, hit, and, and the answer, of course, is to reweight in the marginal structural models framework. And here, of course, we also don't want to adjust for it because we don't know what any of these values are at the time that we want to make the prediction for an individual. So in a way, also, you know, everything sort of works out nicely uh, again under some extremely strong assumptions about um, you know no one measured confounding and that um, you know all the things that we all the good prognostic factors that we want uh, don't introduce any problems with bias in estimating the causal effect um, and, and for interest I guess so in that work so on the UK population um, what happens when you apply this kind of method is everybody's risk goes up, of course, because um, the, the treatment naive risk that something like QRIS calculates is not really a treatment naive risk. It's the, it's the risk, um, including the effect of possible future initiation of treatment. So the treatment naive risk is going to be a bit higher. And it turns out that about um, three and a half percent of the population uh, would additionally cross the 10% uh, threshold and therefore be considered for statins if you, um, you know, if you try and calculate a, a true treatment naive risk, at least with respect to, to statins. So um, I suppose in a way it's a, I mean, certainly important for that three and a half percent, but I guess um, certainly for us, uh, a, a bit disappointing that it didn't make that much difference uh, um, when we went down this, this road in terms of sort of the overall population. But, but you know, as I say, clearly it's relevant to the to the subgroup of individuals who are affected. Okay. So, um, let me talk a bit about something else. Um, so. Another peril uh, of not thinking causally, which uh, I've caused here is the prediction, which I've called the prediction paradox. So the treatment paradox is often talked about, and that's related to what we were discussing before, that, um, that people who are at, at high, people who have bad risk factors um, often don't do as badly as you think when you build these prediction models, or you know, the, the ri predicted risk is not as high as you think. And that's because of exactly what we discussed, that, um, that in our historical development data set, somebody with high blood pressure and high cholesterol probably received lots of intervention from their, um, from their clinician um, in order to try and avoid that. So, so that's the treatment paradox, um, which you know, at best I suppose, is, is just going to attenuate the, um, the, the hazard ratios compared with if, if we built a truly treatment naive model. Um, but if you think about it, the, the same sort of thing happens uh, if we imagine the whole sort of pipeline of building a prediction model, deploying that prediction model, and then updating that prediction model. Um, so the picture here on the left um, is um, Harry Seldon. So if, if you're into your science fiction, this is from Isaac Asimov's uh, foundation. Um, and essentially, th this Harry Seldon um, was uh, I think they called him a psycho historian, and he was somebody who, in the uh, sorry, it's a long time since I've read this book, but in the Galactic Empire or whatever it is, he he made predictions about what was going to happen in the future. Um, but his caveat about this was saying, you know, these predictions are great, you know, these are one hundred percent accurate, you know, the, the mean squared error is zero, we know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, but that's on the caveat that the population of the Galactic Empire. Um, sorry to any Asimov fans, <laughs> um, should remain in ignorance of the results of the application of, um, of my analyses. Because as soon as, you know, as soon as the group becomes aware of the predictions, the group will change their behavior. Uh, you know, and, and this is kind of an obvious point. I mean, you know, um, if um, I usually give an example of a train crash, but nobody's really catching trains at the moment. But, uh, you know, if, if you... Uh, go out on one of your essential trips tomorrow and, uh, and you're told, oh, with high probability, you're going to get run over when you cross the road. And I suspect if you, know, if you really believe that prediction is true, I think you probably won't cross any roads or at least you'll be 
more careful than usual when you do cross the roads. So you probably therefore influence that prediction. Um, so, so, th so that's the sort of thing that I'm talking about here. So consider a group of patients who have high risk if no action was taken. So we imagine generously that the prediction model was fit in historical data where no action was taken. And therefore these patients are classified as high risk. So these may be people with quite high blood pressure or cholesterol, but we're using data from long, long ago before statins or many of the other effective interventions we have now. So, so pretty much nothing was done with these patients to um, alleviate their risk. Um, but from our perspective, that's good news because now the prediction model is deployed into practice. Um, these patients cross the threshold where we're supposed to take action and these patients receive an intervention. Um, they, they get their statins or their blood pressure lowering medication or they're encouraged to stop smoking or do some more exercise. And therefore for these patients, assuming the interventions are effective, many, many of the, the bad outcomes of strokes and heart attack are now avoided. And now somebody publishes a paper and says, well, well look at this, our risk score doesn't work anymore. If we now look at its calibration in, um, in our recent publication, it's terrible. It's uh, massively overpredicting predicting um, risk for everybody. So we need to come up with a new risk score or we need to tweak the parameters of the old risk score to correct this problem. Um, and that's you know, widely agreed to be good practice. And I certainly don't disagree that, that this is good practice, that we should correct the, um, the calibration drift in these models. But the problem of course now is that this model has now been refit. Um, it's now people with high blood pressure and high cholesterol in the development population of the new model have received interventions. And therefore when we deploy this new model, um, the same individuals are then predicted as being at low risk. And therefore we say, okay, well, okay, this person does have quite high blood pressure and high cholesterol, but the model says their risk is only 8%. So we won't do anything. Um, and, and then of course, what you see then is you end up with a cycle. Um, uh, uh, so now the model gets refit and goes back to how it was. So, so you get in this sort of movement in the threshold of, of what's being done. And, and, and that's what, um, we're calling the uh, prediction um, paradox here, which um, I, I, think, I think has also been called performative prediction in the literature, um, this, this same idea. So again, I mean, you know, I've, I've, I also speak a lot and I'm very interested in how we should update um, clinical prediction models to ensure that they remain relevant. And uh, you know, I guess up till now, um, I've, not really, certainly not really done it in a, in a causal framework, but, uh, but I, you know, I increasingly think that because of this kind of problem, that's very important. So it's not enough just to recalibrate a, a prediction model when that prediction model has been deployed. We have to sort of think through, has the deployment of this prediction model changed the way we intervene? And therefore we need to think quite carefully about, um, about what the new risks of, uh, about what these new risks are when we update the model. Okay, so let me talk about what I think are some interesting uh, unanswered research questions. Um, and I think the absolute big and, and really obvious one is how, if we build a model based on counterfactual or, or hypothetical prediction, whatever we want to call them, um, then how on earth do we validate them? So usually in a, in a factual prediction model, the approach we take is we look at what actually happened in outcomes in an individual and we compare those with our predictions and we maybe calculate, you know, the usual sorts of thing, mean squared error, we can look at calibration and discrimination. So in that line of thinking, we, we can, we're only able to validate what we actually see. So with a counterfactual prediction, um, we're interested in what didn't happen as well as what did happen. So we want to know, um, you know, essentially for any individual, we want to know what their outcome would have been if we'd have intervened in a different way, potentially, in order to be reassured that this is a good uh, model. Um, and, and this is very challenging, I think. Um, one approach that I've seen is that you somehow convert the factual outcomes into a counterfactual outcomes. 
And the way that you do that is by assuming that the causal part of the model is incorrect is correct. So essentially you, you say, well, well, actually all I want to do is validate my predictions. So assuming that the causal part is true, then I can apply the sort of causal, you know, I can tweak the outcomes by, you know, I don't, you know, naively think of, well, you know, if, if, it, if, it, if it's a time to events, then I can just think something like an accelerated failure time model and decelerate or accelerate when that failure should have happened if the person received, you know, if we want to consider a different intervention strategy. Um, so, yeah, I think it's challenging. I, th I think the key point is that what we mean in causal inference by validation is so different to what we mean by validation uh, in prediction. And, uh, you know, we, we have to think about how to reconcile that. Um, the other thing that, well, I mean, it's perhaps partly answered, but um, something that I think is quite interesting is um, that if we consider importing, um, so, so what we probably want to do is consider importing causal effects from different sources. Um, and therefore we're triangulating data from, from more than one source, and, you know, potentially many sources if we have many different causal effects and things. And uh, I know that this is an active area of research for many people, but you know, just pointing out that I think, you know, it's highly relevant here uh, as well. Um, and you know, depending on the way you go about it, um, so for this, this third point, um, there is a possibility if you build the model in a certain way, especially if you try and do an all-in-one approach where you want to estimate your prediction model and your causal bit in the same uh, exercise, um, then you potentially end up with conflict. So you may have um, you know, a collider, something that acts as a collider, for example, which is a really strong prognostic factor. Um, that therefore you'd want to include in your prediction model, but it introduces bias to the causal effect. I mean, I expect, I don't think this is a, probably not a hard problem to solve, but uh, it's certainly not some, you know, I've not seen a specific illustration of how it should be done um, if, you, if you're constructing the, these sort of combined um, prediction under hypothetical interventions models. And again, I, th you know, I think the final thing is, um, so if you think of cardiovascular risk, so, so what I've done and with my colleagues and what others have done is usually we, we isolate one probably binary treatment. Does somebody get statins, yes or no? And think about what the, um, the risks are under each of those strategies. But of course, in reality, if somebody's cardiovascular risk is high, then there are many, many things that we can do. Um, so there's medica different medications that, that can be given. Um, there's um, lifestyle interventions we discussed, stopping smoking, doing more exercise, improving diet. You know, many of these things are you know, very hard to, to measure and the data will be very poor, of course. Um, and I guess, secondly, dynamic treatments, which, uh, which I suspect is probably, okay. you know, I know that this is an active research area and causal inference, and it's probably a, a case of translating these over. So by, by dynamic treatments, I mean um, a treatment plan that isn't fully determined at time zero. So we might, so rather than sort of entertaining the statins, we might say, okay, either we don't give you statins now or ever for the next 10 years, or we uh, give you statins now and you keep taking them for 10 years and we compare those risks. Um, but in reality, you know, treatment is likely to be that dynamic in the sense of, well, let's start you on statins now. Let's see how you get on. If you manage to get your cholesterol down, then we'll take you off again. But then it's sort of conditional on, on the other risk factors, which, which is a bit more challenging, but, you know, well studied in causal inference. And, uh, you know, so, so I suspect it's a case of um, some smart causal inference people um, helping us to uh, know how to, exactly how to deal with this. Um, I've only got a couple more slides. Um, so I gave a shorter talk on, on this, um, and the very good question was asked by uh, Martin van Smeden, um, you know, which, which is the following, that factual prediction, well, I mean, it's not necessarily hard, but it's, but it's done very badly um, in practice in a lot of cases. So 
for example, um, at the start of the COVID pandemic, um, there was um, a flurry of uh, COVID-19 prediction models of various kinds that, that came out in the literature. And at least in the beginning, they were, they were uniformly poor, you know, done on sample sizes that were too small, very poorly reported. So it was unclear what had been done and generally using poor epidemiological practices. So, you know, so there's an argument, you know, let's at least get fa factual prediction right before we begin to worry about, uh, you know, th this, which is a bit more complicated. And um, I guess another way to think about it is that, you know, there's certainly, so I've talked a lot about um, factual prediction, but, uh, you know, there's some cases where that's going to be absolutely fine. And um, I'd, I'd refer to these as weather forecast predictions. So at the moment, I'm in Manchester. So of course it's raining because it rains all the time in, in Manchester. Um, so I'm going to make some decisions on the basis of that. So, so my decision was I was deciding whether to go for a run or not today. And because it's pouring down with rain and I'm a bit of a fair weather runner, I decided not to go. So clearly the factual prediction about the weather was fine. Whether or not I go for a run, um, even though it feels like it sometimes, but um, doesn't affect um, the weather. So their factual predictions will be fine. So in, um, in medicine and health, there will be examples where factual predictions are fine. And I think the case where they are fine is exactly in these weather forecast cases where the decisions that we're making on the basis of the prediction are not ones that, um, that will affect the um, you know, the outcome that's being predicted. So, you know, whether it rains or not. Um, but actually, once you start to think about it, these are, they certainly happen, but, that, you know, they're quite unusual in, uh, in health and medicine that these predictions actually arise. So, um, you know, one case per perhaps is um, palliative care. So, you know, we want to know, you know, if a patient's discharged into palliative care, so end of life um, treatment, it's perhaps useful for them to know, you know, what their prospects are in terms of getting their affairs in order. Um, another case perhaps is operational planning. So, so at the moment in COVID, you know, we want to know, the hospitals want to know how many admissions are going to come through the door tomorrow. Um, you know, they don't want to change that number um, necessarily, but they need to know so that they can prepare. But, you know, other than that, I think most predictions in health are grounded in cases where a decision is going to be taken that affects the thing that you're predicting. And there, you know, as I think we've shown that um, people are often either interpreting um, prediction models as if they were causal, um, you know, or, um, or, or, or wishing very much that they could. So given that this is happening, you know, my perspective on this is that we should at least um, try and help make sure that this is being done in a more correct way, or at least raise awareness of uh, the assumptions that are required to, to do this in the correct way. And, uh, um, you know, and, and the fact that they are unlikely to be true in a lot of cases. Um, okay, so I'll, finish there with a, a brief summary. Um, so the take home message, you know, the first bullet, I hope, you know, I guess for this audience is probably an obvious point that, you know, prediction models cannot at least usually be interpreted causally. Um, but being able to predict under hypothetical intervention seems almost always to be useful. Um, and of course, there's, you know, I think there are a lot of questions still around how to do this, particularly when it, we think about validation and, and complex, um, complex is a bad word to use, you know, when we have many treatments and dynamic strategies that we're intervening them. Um, and just my, my perspective at the moment is that um, it seems to me wisest to uh, you make use of existing robust causal effects and import those where possible. So to use the effects from clinical trials um, to, um, you know, to try and make our, the causal part of our estimation more robust. So I think that these, you know, integration from multiple sources approach probably deserves some more attention. Uh, so I'll finish there. I'll, I'll flash up this uh, references 
page, which uh, is just a variety of the things that I've referred to throughout this presentation. So thank you for listening and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so, so much for the talk. Um, I'm clapping on behalf of the 100 participants here in the room and uh, our panelists. So thanks a lot, Matt. I am really looking forward to the discussion.